Okay. Okay, we are live now. A very good evening and a warm welcome to everyone. Naperu Sri Devi Jagalamudi, Nenu Telugu Kala Samiti, Adekshrani. E. Yeru Telugu Kala Samiti, twenty twenty two ki. Uh, first event and the Anukane Munduga Telukala Samiti Sabilaku Atme Laku Shreyobilashalaku E. Karakraman Vikshis the Nami Andariki Nutana Samachara Mariu so, uh, Sankranti Pandaga Saba Kamshan Ma Telukala Samitiki New Jersey Law Nama Telukala Samitiki Dadapu Mopay the Samachara Paiga Cheritra on the Andigana Cheritra on the E. Telukala Samiti Dwara Me Mikada Ikaruna Telugu Varaki, Telugu Bashanu, Samskurti, Sampradaya Lanu, and the chest too, Yutuni encouraged chest too, Mundik Southunam. Alage Kadandi, Sampradaya Le Kadu, Telugu Bashe Kadu, Mana Kawasana, Community Kawasarani, Ayasarmina, Health Kanyandi, Yoga Samaninchin Kanyandi, Financial Kanyandi, Immigration Anandi, lay that a youthic Samaninchin, a college seminar Sanandi, it one divani. Memo uh, conduct chest to webinar Dwara, Mianaki Telsu, uh, pandemic co coni ups to downs, not a prosu consu nandi, pranamic Dwara, but one of the pros loite, it want a webinars in a conduct chessy, Vivita Rangalo, Avagahana, Mana members of Karimandi, Andariki, uh, Avagahana Kalagi Adaniki, Munchi platform ite, and which in Nandi, Atlake Kakunda, uh, local and Kakunda, e webinar Dwara. Ekarina, Everena, Ekarina, Prapanchamlo, Nalumula Nanavalu, Yede, A Time Law in Akani, it went to Watani, attend I, Ledu Vanante, YouTube Dwara Chusi, educate Avagalaru. That is one of the greatest and we all learn during the pandemic and Ikabote, Danlo Baganga, Inati, Ma Health Mida, Health Webinar and the Meandarki Telso, Health is Wealth Anni, Andarki Telso. So Manam Bauntene, Manam Maname Kaka. Mana Pillalu, Mana family, so Mana Chutupaka on the world could abound Daru. So healthy is wealth and Edanimita. E. Kota Samachrani, E. Webinar Dwara, Star Chest Namandi, Munduga, E. Rosanato Patu, my team members Naru, Mundu Valen Parishan Chesi, a program doc Eldamu, Nato Patu, my team members Sandy, Bindu Secretary Bindu Elamanchili, Ipurajaina, my treasurer Jyoti Gandhi. Our uh, Vice President come membership chair, Srinivas Chair. Namaste. And our IT chair, Anuradha Dasari. Namaskar. You the community chair, Ravi Anadanangar. Namaskar. So, event chair, Anuradha Para Jaina Vlek Poyarandi. Idi ma members Sandi. You go the Unkoka Vishamandi before we go into uh, the program. Um, I just want to convey our uh, condolences to Kauta family and Sri Sita Ramaya Kauta passed away this morning. We just found out that he passed away this morning. I know Satveni Garu, I was about to tell you, but uh, just want to convey this one. And also they are our uh, life members, as well as uh, her wife, uh, Srimati uh, Srimantini Kauta Garu is a longtime supporter of TIFAS, as well as one of the organizers, coordinators of uh, uh, Trimurti Day, one of the event we've been doing almost 35 years. So we just have a, we just found out to this morning. So I just want to, let's, let us take a moment of silence to respect and honor Sri Sita Ramaya's departed soul. Thank you, everyone. So now let's get into our program. Just want to couple of uh, Zoom rules. I just want to uh, uh, mention it. And now that uh, this session uh, uh, session is uh, live on YouTube, I think in the chats, we just uh, shared the YouTube link. If you want to share with your friends and family, please feel free. And if you are not the presenter and you are not talking, please uh, mute yourself. When you have a question during the presentation, or after the Q&A session, please use the Zoom chat to uh, propose your question. One of our team members will convey that, will read those questions, and will try to get you answers. 
That being said, today's for the today's webinar, our moderator is Satveni Raugaru. Satveni Raugaru also is our life member. Not only that, she's our past president, woman, one of the women past president, and she's also a doctor for herself. That being said, Satveni Garu, welcome, and please take the program. Thank you. Namaskar, Mandir. Naper Satyaveni, and I'm a radiologist, and I work at the East Orange VA Hospital as a radiologist and assistant chief of imaging for the past 20 years. And first of all, I think some of you know me from the past TEFAS uh, memberships and everything, uh, cultural association, as, and also I was a president, as Sri Devigaru said it. But, um, and then I dropped out of sight after 2002 for personal reasons and family issues and everything. Now, I really have to thank Mrs. Sri Devi Jagarlamudi for giving me the opportunity to come back again and conduct this health seminar. And thank you so much for doing that for me. And as you all know that when we are in the 20s, 30s and 40s, we are trying to try to come to this country and then settle down a little bit, make money, you know, raise the children and everything, but we forget our own health issues. By the time you turn around, you are 45 or 50 years old and then it hits you. You are listening to all these stories about he passed away, she is sick and all that stuff. And then it hits you. By that time, for some people, it's too late. Therefore, this seminar is mainly addressing that kind of issues. I have two speakers on board, Dr. Madhavi Pamdi and Dr. Silpa Gadirazu. Dr. Madhavi Pamdi will be addressing the issue of about heart problems, how to keep it strong and relaxed. That's one of the most important things. And Dr. Shilpa Gadirazu will be talking about prevention of diabetes and how to take care of it. If it happens, what are the precautions you have to do and how to deal with that. So you can see Dr. Madhavi Pamri. Without any further delay, I introduce Madhavi Pamri. She is a cardiophysiologist. I'm sorry, cardiac electrophysiologist. I'm so sorry about that. She works with the New Jersey Cultural Cardiology Associates. She's associated with the St. Barnabas Healthcare System. She graduated from Osmania Medical College and the training was in Montefiore Medical Center, Columbia Presbyterian, as well as Brown University. Her topic is today, help your heart to stay strong and relaxed. Welcome to the stage, Madhavi. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I appreciate TFAS really, you know, putting this platform forward for uh, to answer healthcare needs and answer questions to the public. Satyavani Garu, thank you for reaching out to me about this. When she first said, uh, let's talk about something to do with heart, I was uh, tempted to present something sexy, like the procedures we do in the lab, the interventions we do. But important thing, I think, is prevention. That's the number one rule. Um, I think, you know, what they say, uh, the stitch in time saves lives. So I think prevention is the key. So let me uh, uh, try to share my screen here. Uh, is it, did it come up, Wendy? Not yet. Sorry. It's all right. Yeah, okay. now we see it. There you go. Uh, so the topic for today is uh, um, help your heart stay strong and relaxed. What do I mean by that? I mean, Madhi Garu, Madhi yeah? Garu, let's uh, share your presentation. We are seeing your desktop. How about now? Yeah. Good. So can you see it now, Andy? Yes. Okay. 
so why worry about your heart? Because heart disease is the number one killer in the world across all uh, races and men and women. About 30% die from heart disease uh, this day and age. But why is it relevant to us? South Asians we know are at a higher risk for heart disease. And the risk for heart disease builds up as over your lifetime. So we can act now to prevent it. It's more likely as we get older. And a couple of graphs to just, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words. Uh, in the beginning, there was, you know, age of pestilence, famine, infectious diseases. But as technology advanced, we learned to drink clean water, use vaccines. The COVID has thrown a curveball on us. Uh, the, the diseases related to cardiovascular disease went up and then they started coming down. But now since 1990, thanks to our uh, current pandemic of inactivity, obesity, the death rates are going up in both genders, men and women. There's always this uh, pre, uh, misconception that women are at lower risk, not so. I mean, numbers don't lie. They're going up and relevant to us, you know, Countries which have highest number of cardiovascular deaths, India is one of them, and we are still raising. Uh, the reds and purples show you the percentage change recently, and you know we see a lot of reds and purples over India. Uh, so that's it's a real problem. What can we do? I mean, the solution is simple, yet hard. You know, as most things in life, uh, healthy lifestyle throughout the life. If you don't take anything else from my presentation. This is the key. Try to live healthy every day, starting now, forever. Why should we do that? Because it will prevent something called atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Basically, blockages in your blood vessels, anywhere, in your heart, in your brain, in your legs. That's what cardiovascular atherosclerosis means. Heart failure is fluid buildup, like where you can breathe, you have fluid building up in your lungs or atrial fibrillation is an irregular rhythm. It's an arrhythmia. That's the most common rhythm problem that we see in people. All these could be prevented to a big extent if we only live a healthy lifestyle. Um, so what is a blockage? It's basically a plug that builds up in your blood vessel. It's made of fat, cholesterol, calcium, some blood cells, some fibrin, like a blood clot or whatever you see, that stuff. This process, believe it or not, starts in, a, in your childhood as an adolescent, a young adult, it starts very early. It's asymptomatic, you don't see anything, it doesn't speak to you, but it's there behind lurking in the back. Uh, that's what hardening of the arteries under, that's what it is. This is what eventually leads to blockages as you get older. So let's stop a second, what is heart attack? When this clot builds up in your blood vessel, sometimes it ruptures be any trigger, a stressful life, something very stressful, or a, a little puff of cigarette you took, anything can make that plaque, or the cholesterol just went up very high, something will trigger it. If that plaque ruptures, it forms a blood clot, just like you cut yourself, you bleed, you clot, it clots. When it clots off, it blocks off the blood supply to your muscle. What happens if you cut circulation to something? The muscle dies. If the muscle dies, you which is essentially a pump that's uh, pumping, well, the muscle will weaken. It won't pump as efficiently, right? And that weakens the muscle. So in cardiology, we say something, time is muscle, we say, because if you have any symptoms of heart attack, you need to get to the hospital right away. You call 911. So what are the things? Chest pain, chest pressure, like somebody's pushing on your chest. Big ringer, you need to call 911. Trouble breathing. Sometimes this can, pain can be in other areas, in your neck, in your jaw, your shoulders, wrist, right? Women uh, present in unusual ways, unfortunately, like uh, acid reflux, slag on the chin. It sounds, it, feels, it sounds like a heart burn, which, like a chest burn, or unusual fatigue, cold sweats. Any of that, you know, call 911 right away. Worry about, oh, am I doing something wrong? Am I abusing the system? No. Symptoms like this, reach out for help. Because remember, time is muscle. So what's heart failure? Like I said, it's fluid buildup. It builds up back in your body, in your lungs. So it causes you to feel short of breath, feel bloated, legs can swell up, your weight goes up, weight goes up before any of these other things happen. Why does heart failure happen? 
if your heart becomes weak, like you have a heart attack we just spoke about, or sometimes it runs in some families or a viral infection like COVID-19 sometimes can cause weak muscle. Or it can also get heart failure from a stiff muscle if the heart doesn't relax, you know, because it's too stiff. It's pumping well, but it's not relaxing. If you can't relax, you can't take things in. So then the blood backs up more fluid. Again, you develop heart failure. So what's atrial fibrillation? It's the most common arrhythmia that happens as you get older. It's an irregular heart rhythm. We call it the quivering heart. So it's very common as you get older, but all the things there, everything is interrelated. So if your blood pressure is high, you are fat, or you have heart failure, uh, all these increase your risk for atrial fibrillation. Also, if you're overweight, you can get sleep apnea, uh, something related to, you know, how you breathe at night, you will be snoring. Uh, that also causes atrial fibrillation. Stress, stimulants, except you're hospitalized for some infection, you can get atrial. Again, uh, lifestyle modifications can uh, control the incidence or prevalence of atrial too. So what can we do for a healthy heart? A healthy heart that stays relaxed. There are a few key mantras, which are very simple. A healthy diet, calorie restriction or weight management, regular exercise, and an active lifestyle. Two separate things that are interrelated. Manage your cholesterol, manage your blood pressure, manage your sugar. Avoid smoking in all forms, whether it's smokeless uh, tobacco, first-hand smoking, second-hand smoking, just avoid it. And moderation in alcohol, if you can avoid it. Um, healthy diet, let's skip to healthy diet. What do we mean by healthy diet? You know, I mean, go back to our roots or the Vedic things, I guess. Uh, more vegetables, fruits, and nuts. More whole grains, lean vegetables, and, you know, fish. Minimize trans fats. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Red or processed meats, refined carbohydrates, or sweetened drinks. Um, use naturally occurring oils that are unhydrogenated, like safflower, canola, sunflower, olive oil. If you have to use margarine, use liquid or tub varieties, not the hard stick forms. Don't use butter. Limit the use of butter. L uh, or, or, Limit saturated fat to 5 to 6%. Limit your salt intake or the sodium intake. It's very hard for a lot of us South Indians, I think. Uh, limit it to one teaspoon a day for, for, per person. So coming back, going back to trans fats, trans fats are not natural. These are all like uh, for the, to increase the shelf life of a lot of processed foods, the industry has added trans fats. And FDA has actually now banned it. So a lot of products can list it as zero grams of trans fats, but they can list it as such, even if they have, they have very little amounts, like less than 0 0.5, they're allowed to list it at zero. So you should make sure you look at the ingredients, make sure you don't pick up anything that says partially hydrogenated oils or vanaspati, like you know, we use it. So what are the, some of the examples of trans fats? I mean, there are a whole bunch of them, but for specific to us, puris, pakoras, gulab jamuns, and, you know, sometimes, especially, you know, we're used to, oh no, oil is getting wasted. You know, let's reuse it, we just fried something. Make sure you don't reuse the oils, right? Uh, shortening, a lot of times people use shortening for baking things, don't use that, okay? So a bunch of things that you should avoid, you know? It, big goods are usually tend to have more trans fats too, especially if they have that unhydrogenated oil. I mean, partially hydrogenated oils. Uh, well, are all fats bad? No, some of them are good for you. The omega-3 polyunsaturated fat foods, as we call them, pupas. These are the ones that uh, they reduce inflammation, like, uh, I don't know the right, yeah, they reduce uh, uh, like the ang body getting angry at you, the inflammation part is cut down. Triglycerides are a kind of fat that you see more with diabetes or if you're overweight, it cuts it down, it lowers your blood pressure, makes you less likely to clot. It's a good thing, especially if you have uh, that clot which can build up into blood clots on top, reduces your risk for stroke. So what are some of the things that have these PUFAs? Like salmon is good, trout is good. I mean. Usually in general, even among the kind of fish, the younger, the uh, whiter fish are better, 
more like vegetarian fish. The, the bigger fish which eat other fish are bad because they accumulate the mercury, the PC, BCPs, are more carcinogenic, so stick to the smaller ones. So what if you are a vegetarian? So flax seeds, walnuts, canola oil, chia seeds, these are good, soybeans. So moving on to the next thing, weight management. I know it's not about body image, it's about your heart health, right? And you need to know two things, your BMI, that is your body mass index and your weight circumferences. These are two main things. So how do you measure BMI? This, it's a simple formula, your weight in kilograms divided by your height in meters square. That's your BMI. It has to be between 18.5 to you know, less than 25. In most adults, 18 to 65 years of age. And your waist circumferences, it's a little smaller for us Asians. We lose our there too. For Indian men, we are in Asians actually, it has to be less than 90 centimeters. And for women, 80 centimeters. Again, you measure it around your belly button level after you just, you know, with normal breathing, just breathe out regularly and measure it at that time. So how do you manage your a couple of things? Like, unfortunately, Asians, we, at, for the same BMI, we have a higher risk for high blood pressure, higher risk for developing this cardiovascular disease or clock, higher risk from, of dying from it when you wear overweight. Uh, it also increases your risk for diabetes more so compared to the Caucasians. It also increases your risk for irregular heart rhythm, the quivering heart we talked about before. So how do you manage your weight? Control your portions, take small portions, avoid fried or breaded food, avoid any canned or frozen food with syrup or added sugar in it. Always choose whole grains over refined grains like brown rice or buckwheat. Uh, limit your saturated fat intake and avoid creamy sauces. I know for the most current generation, uh, Indian kids seem to like the foods with creamy sauces. They're not good for you. Next mantra, mantra number three, I think, is regular exercise, right? At least 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. You can spread it over the week. What is moderate intensity exercise? What does that mean? Brisk walking or biking at like five, five to six miles an hour, some yoga, swimming at your pace, uh, or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity physical activity, which is like jogging, biking at a faster pace, tennis, laps, right? Let's say, okay, I can do all this. I'm older or I have arthritis. Any activity is better than no activity. Do it to the extent you can. Avoid any sedentary behavior. Stay active. Get up and walk. Use a standing desk at work. Get up and walk around a little bit if you're in IT, right? I mean, stay active throughout the day. Going at the end of the day and meeting your 150-minute requirement of exercise is not going to cut it. Be active throughout the day. Next thing is cholesterol. So what are your lipids? Know your lipids. LDL, I always say L for low. L, uh, LDL cholesterol is a bad cholesterol. You want it low. HDL is the good cholesterol. H for high, you want it high. Triglycerides are the fat with diabetes and when you're overweight. The others are also similar things we measure. There's something called non-HDL cholesterol, FOB, lipoprotein A. Not as important to know, but something your physician will measure for you. Um, Cholesterol is something like I'm saying gives you no symptoms, but it causes heart disease. And it's all like dose related. How, how high and how long you're exposed to cholesterol makes a difference. Remember I said the plaque buildups from young age, cholesterol is the biggest factor. So it starts doing its damage right from your young. The longer you have it high, the worse it is. So how do we manage cholesterol? Your doctor will assess what your risk for uh, any major cardiovascular event like a heart attack or a stroke is over a 10 year period based on some features. And then they stratify you into low risk or high risk. Low risk is less than 5% chance of developing something bad in 10 years like a stroke or a heart attack. High risk is more than 20% of developing any of this. If you're high risk, you need to be on a statin, the cholesterol medicines everybody's scared of, but you need them. They're proven to be effective in certain groups of patients. If you're borderline risk, that is five to seven, less than 7.5% or 7.5 to 20% being the intermediate risk, 
we look at other factors to decide what to do. Is it just lifestyle? Remember, everybody has to do these lifestyle changes we talked about. But if you're at a higher risk, then the medications come in. If you're in the between area, we look at what's called risk enhancing factors, metabolic syndrome. That is, you're a little overweight, your sugars are a little high, your fat, your triglycerides are a little high, you're a little bit, uh, you know, apple versus pear, they say. If you're more of an apple shape than a pear shape, where you have uh, abdominal fat or truncal obesity, that comes into play. Family history, or for women, if you get hit menopause by 40, it's bad. If you have high blood pressure, diabetes, your pregnancy, or most South Asians, any chronic inflammation like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, kidney problems, um, or if you have blockages in the blood vessels, we say ankle brachial index. It's basically a measure of blockages in the blood vessels. And some blood markers like trig the ones we talked about in the past that you know, they measure to risk stratify you. So some places where a statin therapy need to, with, is, is a must. If your cholesterol is very high, that LDL, L for low, I said, if that's over 190, no matter where you are, what you're doing, doesn't matter, you need to be on the statin right away. If you have diabetes in this age group, 40 to 75, why 40 to 75? That's the age group that is, you know, studied. We don't know the data in people younger or older yet. That's up to your physician and you to decide, right? And then the risks we discussed just before, if the risk is sufficient enough, like if it's over 20, you need to be on it. If it's under 20% risk, then you decide with your physician, is it high enough for you to be on statin? If you already develop blockages, you need to be on it. Blockages in the heart or your legs, or if you had a stroke or a mini stroke, you need to be on it. Control your blood pressure. Again, heart healthy diet, losing weight, exercise, limiting your sodium intake, increasing your potassium intake, right? Limit alcohol. Alcohol can increase your blood pressure. Quit smoking, right? Smoking is bad again. All that will control your blood pressure, right? Again, you we calculate the risk of you developing any blockages. If your risk is greater than 10%, or if you have diabetes or kidney problem, we, we have a lower threshold to start you on your medications to keep your blood pressure low. You want best blood pressure, you want it below 120 or 80, right? Um, if your blood, and if you're, even if your risk is lower, less than 40%, 10%, we still start medicines if your blood pressure is over 140, over 90. Again, lifestyle changes in everybody. So let's move on to the next thing, smoking. It's Pretty bad for you. I wish there's a ban on cigarettes, uh, personally. Um, it increases your heart rate, it, blood pressure. It promotes your plaque. Not only does it promote plaque buildup, it destabilizes it. Total abstinence is the way to go because even less than five cigarettes a day can, can make the, your disease worse and cause a heart attack and death. Secondhand exposure is not good either. But, you know, you need to quit. If, if not for yourself, for people around you and loved ones around you too. Uh, if you sm stop smoking, you, your good cholesterol increases right away. Uh, your risk for heart attacks drops very quickly within the first two years. Uh, risk for stroke comes to almost as being a non-smoker very soon. It, it reduces your risk for developing something called an aneurysm, weakness of the arterial wall where the artery kind of kind of becomes like, you know, expands and can rupture and cause sudden death. It reduces your risk for that. Uh, it also reduces the risk of a bunch of other things like irregular heart rhythm, heart failure, blockages in the, in the veins, where you get blood clots when you're traveling kind of a thing. So very important to quit smoking. Alcohol, Limited, moderation, you know, less than two drinks a day in men and less than one drink a day in women. And I, my personal belief is even less than that, if you can. Uh, if you have a weak heart muscle already, I really think you should avoid drinking alcohol unless it's a special occasion or something. Uh, diabetes, I will really leave the detailed discussion of that to Silpa, but basically it's good dietary habits, regular exercise. Medication, if indicated, it's usually the metformin. There are other drugs that your endocrinologist will give you um, if you're not controlled after that. 
goal, it has to be less than five, seven. There's something that the measure called hemoglobin A1C. Um, I'm, I'm sure um, you'll hear more about it later on. Uh, something that came in uh, recently, I want to make uh, uh, take a minute to say aspirin for prevention of heart disease. Uh, yes or no is a big question. Uh, don't use it routinely if you're over 70. But if you have had heart disease already, a blockage before, or angina, blood clot anywhere, yes, you should stay on the aspirin, not stop it. Um, if you are at a high risk for developing heart disease and you're between 40 and 70 years of you, in that age group, you can go on aspirin if you do not have a high risk for bleeding. So it's something where you should discuss. In the past, people used to routinely take aspirin. Now, have a discussion with your physician about it. And also do not stop it if your physician puts you on it without talking to them. So in summary, I have to say to you folks, your heart is in your hands. Adopt a very health, healthy lifestyle right now um, to prevent blockages, fluid overload, irregular heartbeat, to do all of these. Healthy diet, calorie restriction, weight management, regular exercise with active lifestyle, Managing your fat, sugars, and blood pressure, avoid smoking and limiting alcohol are the most important things. Um, thank you. That, uh, with that, I'll uh, conclude my talk for today. And if you guys have any questions, uh, I'm going to stop sharing this for now. Yeah, I, that was a wonderful talk, Madhavi. I don't know. Okay. I'm not sure I didn't, if I went over or we have time to discuss. No, 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 no. That, that was great. Uh, we had a couple of questions. Um, Sri Devi Garu, can I ask, or you? you, are, Please, you go ahead. Please go ahead, Sri Devi Garu. Ask uh, the questions related to Madhvi's. Uh, Madhvi's uh, right. The first that. question we had was calcium deposit is shown in the CT scan recent, recently ahead. What has to be done to take care of it? Yeah. So cal let me share the screen again. How do I do that? All right. Calcium score is something where it's just a simple CAT scan. It measures the amount of calcium that is there in your uh, blood vessels in the heart. And they give you a number. The number is between zero to, you know, it goes over 400. And when do you measure it? I wouldn't recommend it being measured in everybody. Remember we talked about risk less than 5%, greater than 20% and the in-between group. Less than 5% usually don't need to check a calcium score unless there's a, those modifying risk factors I talked about, a family history of first degree relative dying at a young age. And then maybe you could over your risk over 20, no need to measure calcium because the treatment we already know. Is that intermediate group is when we measure the calcium score, uh, where if your risk is between 5% to less than 20% range, that's when we measure the calcium score to decide, is this somebody where we need to do more than lifestyle changes? Is it somebody we, where we need to give you a medication for your cholesterol? So if you fall in that intermediate or borderline risk category, we look at your other risk factors, your diabetes, your triglycerides, your weight, are you smoking, all those, and we measure the calcium score. If your calcium score is then zero, then we say, okay, we don't have to start you on medications. If your calcium score is, let's say, over 100, or you fall on the, you know, this, uh, you fall over the 75th percentile, what that means is, people of your age, your sex, your race, uh, if you're on the top 25% within that group for the measurements, then we put you on a medication to control uh, the cholesterol to manage disease. Between one and 99, again, it's again a discussion between you and your physician, look, taking into account all your other risk factors to decide should we do it or not. And you might want to repeat it again five years later to see is it going up, going down. So that's yeah, where that's the calcium right. score comes in, more as a risk stratifier in the in-between group. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that answered your question. Right. Yeah, it does. It does. Uh, I think part of the second question part of this you already answered. 
heart strokes reason and preventions please when a person fallen how long a patient can survive without affecting blood clot in the brain how long can oh. he right once he gets a stroke or some kind of a feeling how long can a patient survive without affecting the blood clot in the brain that's the question uh, i think I they, they are asking for the circulation time well if you if any signs of stroke also it's like the heart right you need to open up that blood blood vessel right away so there are different levels of strokes there are mini strokes where uh, the symptoms resolve right away. There are uh, strokes where there are bigger deficits. Uh, so it depends on the stroke and your uh, life expect. I mean, uh, prognosis wise, life expectancy wise, having a stroke decreases your life expectancy. But again, it depends on how big your stroke is, what your other risk factors are. I mean, stroke also tells you that you're at risk for developing heart attack, blockages in your legs, and you're at risk for developing another massive stroke. Right. So again, these lifestyle changes come into play. It's what we call the secondary prevention, right? What I talked about is primary prevention or primordial prevention, like even before something starts happening. So once you've already had a stroke, you have to adopt all these things to prevent another event from happening in other blood vessels. Right. So there's another question on the chat. Many people say walking 10,000 steps a day will solve all problems. Is that true? I won't solve all problems. It will get you closer to having a healthy, relaxed heart. Right. Uh, the 10,000 steps, maybe it's hard to do 10,000. I don't care. Do 8,000 then or do 6,000. Be active. Make that choice. Like, you know, take that extra step. Yes, steps do count. It's not a cure-all. Nothing is a cure-all in the world. If I say exactly. there's a cure-all, it's not true. You know that. It's one of several things you could do to help your health. Sridevi Garu, questions are popping up. So how do we manage the time? Uh, the questions? Yes, we can take one or two before we move on to Shilpa's presentation. Um, oh. All right, Madhavi. The next question is if aspirin, not certain if aspirin is indicated. Oh, I think you answered that question about aspirin, right? Yeah, I mean, depends yeah, on uh, the last slide. Yeah, like uh, we just talked about it. If you're right. uh, over 70, don't take it routinely until you talk to your physician. If you have increased risk of bleeding, then, you know, right. you shouldn't yeah. take it. So, for prevention. Yeah already had a blockage somewhere you should be on aspirin you've already yeah. had a heart attack you had a stent put in or you yeah. had a stroke you should be on aspirin unless your physician decides you shouldn't uh, but don't routinely take it as a prevention unless you discuss it with your physician okay Srinivasara Chiruvruga are asking there's a lot of confusion on cooking oils for a deep fry etc heard that canola vegetable oil is not good for Indian cooking and again, olive oil should not be used for frying. So is short, in short, a good oil, which is a good oil for Indian cooking? I don't know. I and mean, the best thing is we Indians should move away from deep frying. That is my right. answer. I'll say air fryer now, maybe. So we need to move away from deep frying. That's the bottom line. And I think okay. also I, the, the other thing is not only deep frying, but reusing the a very that important oil, that is the one that a lot of people save the oil like if you uh, uh, fry a papadam you don't want to throw out the oil so they save it they save it and they save it so you're using four or five times the already yeah. oil and i think that's not a good idea yeah that's why I, 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 that's yeah i know you mentioned very important not to reuse a lot of not to reuse the oil that's the whole thing i know it's a lot of wastage but that's the way it is. I proposed to the TFAS committee to set up a talk with a dietitian and nutritionist. <laughs> that would be great. Yes. Sure. We'll do that. <laughs> okay. I think that's all we have so far, the questions. Yeah. Thank you, Madhuri Garu. After a, a Shilpa session, if we have time, uh, I think um, if you are okay to answer some more questions, that would be good. So, sure, sure. Uh, Thank you. It was a pleasure. Please, uh, yeah. Thanks, Madhavi. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Cindy.
that was wonderful um, next speaker is shilpa dr shilpa gadrazu she is an endocrinologist with the summit health group uh, adagar can you bring okay good okay she is a she graduated from robert wood johnson medical school training uh, is at yale university and john hopkins university she right now works at the morristown area in atlantic healthcare system and summit health clear system shilpa take over okay thank you so much sachin aunty so hello everyone uh, my name is shilpa and um, in endocrinology diabetes is one of the main conditions that we treat and diabetes is something that affects so many people so just wanted to talk today um to raise more awareness about this condition and uh today's uh, talk is titled diabetes prevention detection and management so the objectives today um so we're going to talk about what is diabetes first of all what are the risk factors how do we prevent this from happening um if you have it how can you detect the symptoms and how do we manage this next slide, slide please So what is diabetes? So there is type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes. So type 2 is the one that we typically hear about. This is a lot more common and prevalent. Um this often has a strong genetic component, so it gets passed down through families. And in type 2 diabetes, you're still your body is still able to make insulin. it's just that your body can't respond to insulin properly and this is a concept called insulin resistance and we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide but type 1 diabetes is when your body does not make any insulin so typically this is what we see when younger patients develop this you know early on in childhood but it's actually possible for adults to develop type 1 diabetes as well later on in life um in type 1 diabetes obviously you have to take insulin but we'll talk a little bit later that in type 2 diabetes actually some people also use insulin so sometimes it's a misconception that people think oh if you're on insulin you're a type 1 diabetic and that's not necessarily true so we're going to focus more about type 2 diabetes on this talk um because that's what's more prevalent and what we see So what is insulin resistance? I talked about that concept. So let's talk about what happens when you eat. When you eat, you know, something with sugar or carbohydrates, this gets converted into glucose or sugar in your blood. And when that is detected, your body usually should be releasing insulin. And the insulin then helps um bring that blood sugar out of the bloodstream and into your organs and the organs then use it as energy. but when you have insulin resistance that means that your organs are unable to respond to the insulin so that just leaves this blood sugar floating around in your blood and it remains high next slide please so why is it a bad thing to have the blood sugar floating around in your blood like that so let's talk about what are the complications of high blood sugar So one is something called retinopathy and this is when the high blood sugar can affect your eyes and people don't really realize it on a day-to-day basis there's no real symptoms but, but what's silently hap- happening is that the blood sugar is um affecting the retina and there can be bleeding happening in the back of your eye in the retina and ultimately if it's severe it can cause blindness then we have something called neuropathy which is when the blood sugar affects your nerves and this can um cause you to be when the blood sugar affects your nerves and this oh, can um sorry i heard an echo in the background is anyone else hearing that or no yeah there's somebody I heard an echo in the background is anyone else okay okay i think we're okay So with the um with the neuropathy this is when it affects your nerves and you can lose sensation typically in your feet first this happens and again this can be severe because if you have a cut or a scrape or a wound and if you don't feel it it can develop into a major infection and this is what ultimately can lead towards major infections that cause people to need amputations of their um toes or legs and things like that then there can be nephropathy which is when the diabetes affects your kidneys and again if this becomes severe it can lead towards dialysis and then finally 
Um, high blood sugar can also increase your risk of heart disease. So heart attack strokes, these are all tied in with uncontrolled diabetes. Next slide, please. So what are the risk factors that lead towards diabetes? First is family history. So this is genetic, like we talked about. It gets passed down through family. So that's a major risk factor. Then diabetes is actually sometimes more prevalent in certain ethnicities, such as the African-American population, Hispanic population, and the Asian population, which includes us. So also being overweight, obese, this also raises the um, risk of developing diabetes, specifically central obesity when the weight is centered around your abdomen, because this actually increases the insulin resistance that we talked about. And then diet, obviously a diet that is high in carbs and sugar can increase your risk of developing diabetes. And then if you have pre-diabetes or gestational diabetes, so pre-diabetes is when your blood sugar is higher than normal, but just not as high as diabetes. And gestational diabetes is when you develop diabetes during pregnancy. So if you have either of these conditions, your risk of developing diabetes goes up in the future. So how do we prevent this? So first is diet. So it's all about limiting your carbs, which are your breads, pastas, rice, potatoes, and sweets. Basically the carbohydrates get converted into sugar in your blood and that's why it can um, increase your risk of diabetes. And then you wanna stay active, exercise is key. It really helps your body um, respond to insulin better. So it's really very important. So there is an option of using medication to also prevent um, the progression to diabetes. So when people have pre-diabetes, sometimes we can use a medication called metformin to prevent the progression to diabetes. Metformin is actually the most common um, uh, uh, used medication for type 2 diabetes. So the indications that we would use this in pre-diabetes would be if you're young under the age of 60, because if you've already developed pre-diabetes at a young age, we worry about developing diabetes early and the, the risk of having high blood sugar for so long. Another risk is if you're obese, um, and then also if you have the gestational diabetes. So these are all indications where we might actually use medication for prevention to progress towards diabetes. Then the, just briefly wanted to talk about this pivotal study called the Diabetes Prevention Program. This was a major study that just bottom line, it proved that diet and exercise are key in terms of preventing diabetes. So they studied more than 3000 people and everyone was assigned to one out of three groups. One was intensive lifestyle intervention, which is um, significant change in their diet and exercise. Two was receiving the metformin or three was the placebo group, meaning they didn't have any change in their diet or exercise and no medication. And the study basically proved that the group that um, worked on diet and exercise had the least risk of developing diabetes in the future. Surgery actually can also be a method of preventing diabetes in those who are overweight. So this is called bariatric surgery. Now this is aggressive and it may not be the right choice for everyone, but it is an option and you have to weigh the risks and benefits of if this is something that would benefit you. There's not that much data regarding this, but there was one study where they studied patients who were obese and high risk of developing diabetes. And basically half the group got this weight loss surgery and half the group didn't. And they showed that the group that got surgery that reduced their risk of developing diabetes three to fourfold. So although this is an aggressive intervention and may not be right for everybody, it can be very effective. So it's something that we do discuss with our patients when they're obese to consider it as an option. So how do we detect this if we do have diabetes? What are the symptoms to be aware of? So one is lethargy, feeling more tired than usual because of that high blood sugar. And then you can also have increased urination and increased thirst. And the reason for this is when your blood sugar is high, your body's trying to get rid of that blood sugar. And it tries to do that by making you urinate out the blood sugar. 
So that'll cause the increased frequency of urination. And because of that, you may get dehydrated. So it causes the increased thirst. Then you may also have an increased appetite as well as weight loss. And you may wonder why those symptoms may arise. So we talked about at the insulin resistance where your body's not able to respond to insulin. So this blood sugar is not coming into your organs for energy. So your organs are searching for energy then, which may lead to the increased appetite. And the weight loss is because when your organs are really searching for energy, sometimes they end up breaking down your muscle and using that protein for energy instead. And that breakdown of muscle can actually lead towards the weight loss. Then you may have blurry vision. The high blood sugar can change how the cornea stretches. So it changes the elasticity of the cornea and that can result in blurry vision. And then lastly, the high blood sugar can increase your risk of infections and cause delayed healing of wounds. So the reason for this is that bacteria and various organisms, they like sugar. So they concentrate where there's high blood sugar and that can cause these increased infections like yeast infections and urinary infections when people have high blood sugar. So how do we manage this? So diet is the main thing. You wanna limit those carbs. And we're not saying that you can never eat carbs, but it's all about moderation and just trying to be mindful of how often and how much you're having about these carbs. And we'll talk a little more about the quantities on the next slide, but um, I just wanted to also mention that some carbs are actually a little bit better than other carbs. So your complex carbs. So these are less processed. So your body has to break them down further and that can help because then it slows the spike in the blood sugar if your body's trying to break it down further. So examples of these more complex carbs are things like brown rice or quinoa or millets. And these are all good substitutes for white rice. And then sweet potato actually is better than regular potato and whole wheat bread is better than white bread. So in terms of quantities, let's talk. So we usually uh, tell our patients who are diabetic to try to limit their meals to a maximum of 30 to 40 grams of carbs per meal. And for snacks, trying to limit to about 15 grams of carbs per snack. So sometimes it's hard, especially in our cooking to know how much is what. So I listed a couple things just to give us a sense of how many carbs are in these foods. So a cup of rice is about 45 grams of carbs. A cup of quinoa is about 39 grams of carbs. A cup of millets is about 41 grams of carbs. A slice of bread is about 15 grams of carbs. A cup of lentils is about 40 grams of carbs. And a cup of yogurt is about 16 grams of carbs. Exercise obviously is also very, very critical in managing the diabetes. You wanna exercise about 30 to 40 minutes per day, about three to four days a week. And both cardiovascular exercise as well as weight training are good. I try to tell my patients to focus a little bit more on that cardiovascular exercise. So you're really, it's burning those calories that really helps reduce that insulin resistance. So medications, we talked that metformin is one of the most common medications used for type two diabetes. And the way that this works, it actually reduces the production of glucose from your liver. And it also makes your body more sensitive to insulin. So your body responds to insulin better. So this is a great medication for that reason because it's actually getting at the underlying cause. It's not really a band-aid; it's really helping the underlying cause here. There are some side effects, mainly stomach upset. Um, so nausea, bloating, diarrhea, these are the types of side effects. Um, not everyone experiences that. Many patients do fine on it. But if you do develop the side effects, um, sometimes we can switch to the extended release version, which is often tolerated better. So just talking a little bit more about medications and you know, I don't, the reason why I'm talking about medications is more so I know lots of patients are very hesitant about adding medications and their side effects and everything, which I completely agree with. Obviously, less meds is always better, but if the blood sugar is high, that's dangerous and we need some help to bring the blood sugar down. And um, yes, the side effects sometimes can be 
you know, scary, but uh, the side effects of high blood sugar can obviously also be very scary. So it's important to understand the benefits of some of these medications. And also know that just because you start a medication, it doesn't mean that you will be on this for the rest of your life. Many times as people work really hard on their diet and exercise, I have been able to stop medication on many patients or at least reduce or reduce the number of medications. So just because you start medications, it doesn't mean it's a life sentence that you'll always be on it. So that's the purpose of talking about these meds just to make everyone a little bit more comfortable if they ever encounter this. So one class of medication, sorry, can you just go back to the previous slide again? Okay, so one class of medications is, um, includes Osempic, Trulicity, Victoza, and Rebelsis. And you might've seen commercials for these medications, um, but these are great. They actually, um, they slow down the emptying of your stomach. So they help make you feel full longer and it decreases the appetite. And they actually help release this hormone that then helps with weight loss. So they're very helpful and they actually have cardiovascular benefits as well. Um, so they're great medications. Side effects are typically stomach issues, but you know, patients usually talk with us and if there's an issue, we figure out plan B. Then there's another class of medications. So these include Jardiance, Farxiga, Invokana. The way that these work is they actually make your body urinate out the blood sugar. So it's good, it's getting rid of the blood sugar from your body. These actually also have a benefit of helping with weight loss and they also have cardiovascular benefits associated with them. Um, actually, Madhavi Garu probably knows a lot of the cardiologists love this, this class of medications and they call us all the time to ask us to prescribe these for their patients. Side effects are actually um, increased urination and then sometimes yeast infections as well. And then insulin. Insulin can also be used, as I mentioned, in type two diabetes. So the reasons why we end up with insulin sometimes is if the blood sugar really is very high and somebody's already on all the non-insulin meds and we have no other option, we do have to add insulin in that situation. Um, and then sometimes some people try various non-insulin meds and they develop lots of side effects. So in that situation, we also go towards insulin because there's very low risk of side effects from insulin. And then finally, some people have advanced kidney disease. And when your, kidneys, uh, when your kidney function is low, you're not able to filter many of the non-insulin meds. So then we're, we have limited options for medication and then we also use insulin in that setting. Next slide. And that's basically it. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Shilpa. That was great. Um, I think you, I, one of the questions that you already answered, but the second question is, does fasting sugar enough to determine whether you are a diabetic or do you need to get specific blood work done to determine accurate results for it? So yeah, there's actually various ways to check blood sugar, and we have various uh, thresholds of what we consider diabetic versus pre-diabetic. To be diagnosed with diabetes, you need two blood sugar ways of measuring blood sugar in the diabetes range. So that can be two fasting blood sugars in the diabetes range. So it can be diagnosed with just fasting blood sugar. Or we also have the hemoglobin A1C, which is the three month average of your blood sugar. We have non-fasting blood sugar. And then we also have the oral glucose tolerance test, which is when you drink this sugary drink and then they measure your blood sugar two hours later. So these are all the various ways that um, we measure sugar and we have thresholds. So any of these, if just two numbers are in the diabetes range, you can get diagnosed with diabetes. Okay, the other question is, can you develop type 2 diabetes after 70 years of age? Yes, certainly. At any age, you can develop this. So we see patients who say they never had a blood sugar issue until, you know, it comes up either at age 70 or 80. So it can develop at any age. So unfortunately, you're never really out of the clear um, and always have to true. follow that healthy lifestyle. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, that was great. And those are, anybody else has any questions? 
Shri Devi. If anyone has a specific question, you can unmute yourself and please ask uh, uh, Shilpa Garu or Madhavi Garu, any health related also. I have one question. Andy. So it looks like the, I mean, the carbs from fruits, right, would convert to glucose also, right? The fructose would convert. So what percentage of would, would that be converted? So, so that, okay, I mean, uh, people can uh, take more fruits instead of uh, simple carbohydrates and all, right? Yeah. So it's not really like a percentage, but yeah, certain fruits just contain high value of sugar. And even though we consider fruits to be healthy, um, and yes, they are natural sugars, it's still sugar, unfortunately. So we still tell our patients that they have to limit some of these fruits that are higher in sugar, such as the famous mangoes in our South Indian community, um, pineapple, apples, grapes, bananas, these are all very high in sugars. We usually the rule of thumb is to try to stick to the berries. So your strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, these are probably the lowest in the sugars from the fruits that are a little safer. Okay. Dr. This is about H1, um, HbA1c number. Um, my primary physician says that the AMA keeps on changing the range from 6.1 to 6.8 to 7. So what is the reason? I mean, is it because of the studies done by patients that the range is acceptable or um, the sample size is increasing? So can you please clarify what is an acceptable number? Yeah, so your goal for the A1C is to keep it under, once you have diabetes, the goal is to keep that number under 7%. And the reason being that they've studied that if you keep it under 7%, you're at very low risk of the complications that we talked about. So if you can keep it under seven, the lower you can get it, obviously the better, but we also have to balance that with the risk of sometimes when people are on meds, there's also a risk of having low blood sugars, especially as people get older. So there is that balance, but overall the rule of thumb is keeping it under 7% once you have diabetes. This is more of a statement, uh, Dr. Silpagaru. Um, one of the, I mean, at my age, it's uh, I've learned that uh, even now as, as the main person who cooks in my house, um, Pappannam is a very common thing, right? Rice and dal, right? I've always thought dal is like your protein, rice is your carb. But after recently speaking to a nutritionist, he, he basically said in a plate, you have like one third rice, one third. That's like two carbs, really. Yeah. yeah. And what an eye opener after um, listening to that, that we include mana papputa partu rice kodakana. So there's just so much carb that we're taking into our diet. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's sad to know that, yeah, because it's a staple in our diet, but it, it's it's a protein, but it's a starchy protein. Yeah. Um, so because of that kind of starchy nature to it, it does get converted into carbs. So yeah, that's why I included that in the list of the foods that I mentioned, since that's part of our diet, that a cup of lentils is really equal to a cup of rice, essentially, the amount of carbohydrates. So basically, we have to eat only the without rice. <laughs> yeah, all moderation. So if you have, yeah, it's all about just limiting the quantity. We eat a lot of vegetables, right? That's good for us in our in our diet. I think we should increase the quantity of vegetables. Like I see in some families, there's more rice and less vegetable. We need to change that. More vegetables, less rice. Um, I have a question, Madhavi Garu. I know yeah. most of us go for a physical checkup yearly once. And is that like, uh, that's it. enough for us? Or what are other basic or necessary tests we should go and uh, have it done in a certain age as we are progressing in age wise? So. Anything you so can add on? After 40, I think yearly check is good unless you develop more risk factors, right? Let's say we talked about cholesterol management. Once you fall in that category where you need to be treated, then you'd have to be seen more closely till depends on what it is, right? If you started on a statin medicine, then you need to have your cholesterol checked again in like, you know, two to three months time to see is it effective. And then do you need to adjust? Then you'd have to be seen more frequently. 
But for purely prevention things, once a year is good enough to check things. And but when you're under 40, it could be less frequent too. Uh, as long as your initial checkup is okay, you can see them in three to five years. But on average, once a year is pretty good for preventive health care, I think. As long as you follow the healthy lifestyle. Okay. It's really hard to do, even personally. I mean, I struggle with it on a day-to-day -day basis. This is something we as a society have to work towards. And the pressures are high, right? With the, with the way the society has progressed with the more TV watching, more movie watching, and less physical activity, more takeouts, more ordering food, or picking, you know, less cooking for ourselves. Lifestyle. More than doctors. <laughs> I'm hurting myself, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know IT people. They say they sit at the desk, whereas the doctors is like you know uh, extend extended hours of service, like for 16, 18 hours, and they are like stressed out too. So we're all into it together, of course. Yeah. Uh, so we need to, as you said, yes. It's uh, ultimately it's everybody's responsibility when it comes to uh, health and the diet. They have to, based on their lifestyle, they need to adjust to it and uh, uh, adapt. Like you know, healthy lifestyle would be the better way to go for uh, every one of us. So. Um, that being said, any other questions from the members and anything before we conclude the session? But we will, uh, if no other questions, I would like to ask our Secretary Bindu Elementary to do the vote of thanks. Thank you, uh, Sridev Garu. And uh, thank you, Dr. Satyavani Garu, for putting uh, together a wonderful program uh, for all of us. And it's very timely. Uh, it's very interesting on health and well being. Um, this is a uh, you know, again, a, a reminder to take care of us. Um, I learned a lot today, um, especially Corona time. Lo, manandar ki chala ausramai na discussiono. Manavi, yunna parisitlo lockdown start ahi abayan to bite ke alag poatamu. Adan to mali doctor se kare kilte mali aim osundho aim to anje pi. We have uh, neglected uh, taking up our uh, regular health checkups and uh, paying attention to our uh, health uh, needs and mata. This webinar, is a reminder to think about our health, to think about our basics uh, uh, and take care of our health in all types of aspects. Thank you, Dr. Madhvi Garu, Dr. Silpa Garu, for carving out time from your busy uh, schedules uh, to share valuable time with all of us. Uh, and also, I wanted to acknowledge our uh, executive committee, Sridhar Garu, uh, our president, Jyoti Gandhi Garu, our treasurer, Srinivas Cheru Garu, VP uh, membership, Anu Dasri Garu, our IT chair, special thanks uh, for doing an exceptional job uh, supporting us technically. Ravi Anadhanam Garu, our community chair, Anu Para Garu, our culture chair, who couldn't be here today. Uh, from our entire team, we also like to extend our condolences to Srimanthi Garu and her family for their loss. Our thoughts and prayers are with uh, them. Finally, special thanks to all who have attended today uh, via Zoom and uh, watched us uh, via uh, YouTube Live. Because of your interest and, um, and, and asking us to bring programs like this and your support, we were able to um, you know, um, organize them for our community. Thank you very much. My name is Bindu Yalamanchali, Telukkala Samadhi Sektorini, Prasutam Salam.